Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. You count on Democracy Now! to stay focused on the stories that matter most. We count on you to support our independent journalism. If everyone who tunes in to Democracy Now! signed up for a monthly donation of just $10, we could cover our operating costs for the entire year. Really, that's all it would take. Please do your part today by visiting us at democracynow.org. Stay safe, wear a mask, and thank you so much. From New York, this is Democracy Now! I believe this is a moment of potentially great change. This is our moment to deal working people back into the economy. This is our moment to prove the American people that their government works for them, not just for the big corporations, but those at the very top. President Biden's domestic agenda is in jeopardy as conservative Democrats and industry lobbyists push back against his sweeping $3.5 trillion plan to expand the nation's safety social net and to combat the climate emergency while increasing taxes on the rich. We'll speak with Congressmember Ro Khanna about the spending bills, Afghanistan, Iraq, Del Rio, Texas, and more. Then 10 years ago today, the state of Georgia executed Troy Anthony Davis for a crime many believe he did not commit. The court ordered execution of Troy Anthony Davis has been carried out. The time of death is 11.08 p.m. Democracy Now! broadcast live outside Troy Davis's execution 10 years ago on September 21st, 2011. Those of us who knew Troy Davis, and who sat with him, who talked to him, know that he was somebody who was full of love, full of love for his family, full of love for humanity, full of love for a movement that he was born into, a movement for civil and human rights in this country. Somebody who said, this movement started before I died. No matter what happens on the 21st, it must grow stronger. That was then NAACP President Ben Jealous, 10 years ago. He now heads up People for the American Way. He'll join us live, along with Troy Davis's sister, Kimberly Davis. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Del Rio, Texas, photographs and video footage of Border Patrol agents on horseback chasing, grabbing and whipping Haitian asylum seekers have sparked widespread condemnation. One border agent was heard screaming obscenities at asylum seekers, including children, after they attempted to return to a makeshift camp where thousands have been staying underneath a bridge for days. Hey, you use your women? This is why your country because you use your women for this. White House officials said they will investigate the violent attacks. Meanwhile, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas traveled Monday to the makeshift camp in Del Rio, where he once again warned asylum seekers not to come to the United States. Only Haitians living in the United States before July 29th are eligible for temporary protected status. If you come to the United States illegally, you will be returned. Your journey will not succeed, and you will be endangering your life and your family's lives. Driven by hunger, hundreds of Haitian refugees cross back into Mexico and return to the U.S. makeshift camp carrying food. This is a Haitian asylum seeker who says he and his two children went without food for four days. People in the United States don't give us anything, just water. Since children only receive water, children are going hungry. We are out in the open. The United States government has no conscience. Advocates say 
At least three more deportation flights were sent to Haiti yesterday. Several more are expected today and in the coming days as the Biden administration continues its mass expulsion of Haitian asylum seekers, including families and children. The Biden administration signaled Monday it will set a cap on refugee admissions to the United States at 125,000, a significant increase from the Trump administration, which admitted fewer than 12,000 refugees last year. But Amnesty International called on President Biden to go much further, citing political crises in Afghanistan and Haiti. Amnesty said, quote, the very least the United States can do is set a resettlement goal that meets the moment anything but a robust commitment to humanitarian protections for refugees and asylum seekers is a dismal failure, unquote. Here in New York, world leaders have gathered for the United Nations General Assembly with COVID-19 and the climate emergency set to dominate talks. On Monday, President Biden flew to New York ahead of his first address to the U.N. General Assembly today. Biden met with U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who warned the U.S. against provoking a new Cold War with China. Last year's General Assembly was a mostly virtual affair due to the pandemic, but this year thousands from around the world are converging on Manhattan, raising fears of a super-spreader event. On Sunday evening, Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, who has bragged about not being vaccinated, was spotted eating pizza with his entourage on the sidewalk outside a Manhattan pizzeria. New York restaurants require proof of vaccination against COVID-19 for entry. This comes after a member of Bolsonaro's U.N. delegation tested positive for coronavirus after arriving in New York. On Monday, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio had this response. We need to send a message to all the world leaders, including most notably Bolsonaro from Brazil, that if you intend to come here, you need to be vaccinated. If you don't want to be vaccinated, don't bother coming. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres hosted a roundtable discussion with world leaders on the climate crisis, calling on nations, including the United States, to meet their commitments to a $100 billion-a-year climate fund. Guterres' call came just weeks before the U.N. is set to convene a crucial climate summit in Glasgow, Scotland. My message this morning and to the Conference of Parties in November is that we need decisive action now to avert climate catastrophe. And for that, we need solidarity. Saving these and future generations is a common responsibility. Youth activists around the globe are holding a global climate strike Friday, September 24th, including here in New York City, which will coincide with the UN's Climate Week. Ahead of the strike, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg said the movement also needs to tackle racism, sexism and inequality. The climate crisis is caused by the same thing that is also fueling other crises and inequality around the world and the ecological crisis. And we cannot just solve one of these crises without also addressing the others. The United States reported over 2,200 coronavirus deaths Monday, bringing its death toll since the start of the pandemic to 676,000. That's more people than were killed by influenza across the U.S. during the 1918 pandemic. Areas with the lowest vaccination rates remain the hardest hit by the Delta coronavirus variant. For the first time in history, Alabama recorded more deaths than births in 2020. In Mississippi, Republican Governor Tate Reeves condemned President Biden's vaccine mandate for federal workers as, quote, a tyrannical move. Mississippi has the highest death rate from COVID-19 in the United States. If it were a country, Mississippi would be second only to Peru in per capita coronavirus deaths in the world. Meanwhile, the Biden administration said Monday it'll lift COVID-19 travel restrictions in November on passengers from the UK, European Union, China, Iran, Brazil, South Africa and India. 
India said Monday it will resume exporting domestically produced COVID-19 vaccines to other nations five months after it suspended exports of AstraZeneca shots amidst a devastating wave of infections. Meanwhile, a new study finds wealthy nations have stockpiled more vaccines than their populations are willing to consume, with about 100 million doses set to expire unused by the end of the year. In Sudan, government and military leaders say they've thwarted an attempted coup d'etat. Sudanese state media says military officers and civilians linked to the former regime of President Omar al-Bashir unsuccessfully tried to seize a state-run radio and TV building and several other government institutions around the capital, Khartoum. President al-Bashir ruled Sudan from 1993 until April 2019, when he was ousted from power by the military amidst massive popular protests. As tanks and other heavy vehicles surrounded Sudan's parliament, a member of the ruling military civilian council wrote on social media, quote, all is under control, the revolution is victorious, unquote. Canada's Liberal Party is poised to hold on to power and will form a minority government after a narrow election win over opposition Conservatives Monday. Incumbent Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the snap election in mid-August in a bid to win support for his response to the pandemic. You are sending us back to work with a clear mandate to get Canada through this pandemic and to the brighter days ahead. And my friends, that's exactly what we are ready to do. The U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear arguments in December on a case involving a Mississippi law that bans most abortions 15 weeks into a pregnancy. Reproductive justice advocates warn the case poses a direct threat to the landmark 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade. In related news, a doctor in San Antonio, Texas, is being sued after admitting to performing an abortion in violation of a new Texas law. The legislation bans all abortions in the state after six weeks, before most people People even realize they're pregnant and allows for private citizens to sue anyone who aids and abets a person in getting an abortion. The civil lawsuit against physician Alan Braid was filed by a man in Arkansas who has no connection to the abortion at issue and who said he had only filed the suit because of the potential $10,000 reward he could receive if the lawsuit is successful. At least 10 women and girls are killed every day in Mexico. That's according to a chilling new report published by Amnesty International, which also condemns Mexican authorities for failing to investigate femicides. The report, titled Justice on Trial, focuses on Mexico State, which accounts for some of the highest numbers of femicides in the country and details how families and loved ones of victims are often forced to launch their own investigations as they're ignored by law enforcement. Mexico recorded the murders of over 3,700 women in 2020, only 940 of those killings are investigated as femicides. In New York, federal prosecutors have rested their case in the trial against accused sexual predator and trafficker R. Kelly, who faces several charges, including sexual exploitation of children, kidnapping and forced labor. Nearly a dozen survivors and over 30 other witnesses detailed the singer's pattern of sexual and other abuse against dozens of women and underage girls for nearly two decades. Cases against R. Kelly have also been filed in Illinois and Minnesota. If convicted, he faces decades behind bars. New York City's medical examiner's office says it'll investigate the death of a disabled prisoner who died Sunday evening at Rikers Island Jail after complaining he was feeling unwell. 42-year-old Isa Abdul Karim was being held for a parole violation. Under the Less is More Act, just signed last week by New York Governor Kathy Hochul, he might have been cleared for release as early as this week. Abdul Karim is the 11th prisoner to die at Rikers since December. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio's pledge to close Rikers with plans to replace it with a smaller network of borough-based jails. And in Rwanda, the opposition political leader Paul Rusesabagina has been found guilty of terrorism and sentenced to 25 years in prison. He's credited with protecting the lives of some 1,200 people who took refuge at the hotel he managed during the 1994 Rwandan genocide. His story is portrayed in the Hollywood film Hotel Rwanda. Amnesty International denounced Rusesabagina's persecution, saying his trial was riddled with violations. This is his daughter. Karine Kanimba speaking yesterday.
My father was tortured, kidnapped, denied his basic right, and then now they just gave him a guilty verdict. Um, a verdict that comes without any credible evidence. The co-accused came on the stand and said that they had been forced and coerced and tortured into saying false things against my father. And the witnesses are paid a government agents. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show looking what Senator Bernie Sanders calls the most consequential legislation since the 1930s and FDR and the New Deal. We're talking about President Biden's sweeping $3.5 trillion spending plan to expand the social safety net, increase taxes on the rich and corporations, improve worker rights and combat the climate emergency. Senate Democrats are hoping to use the budget reconciliation process to pass the larger package, but this will only succeed if the entire Democratic caucus backs the deal. So far, two conservative Democratic senators, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Joe Manchin of West Virginia, have balked at the $3.5 trillion price tag. This comes as House Democrats Democrats face a looming deadline on September 27th. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi had agreed to hold a vote on the separate bipartisan $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill by that date. But now some House Democrats say the deadline may be missed. A group of progressive Democrats are threatening to vote against the smaller bipartisan infrastructure deal if it's not voted on alongside the larger $3.5 trillion plan. Last week, President Biden urged Democrats to back his spending plan, outlining some of its key components. Investments in roads, bridges, highways, clean water in every home and every school, universal broadband, quality, affordable places for families to live. And we can invest in our people, giving our families a little help with their toughest expenses, like daycare. Child care, elder care, prescription drugs, health care, preparing the young people to compete against any country in the world with preschool and community college. We can confront this crisis of extreme weather and climate change and not only protect our communities, but create new opportunities, new industries and new jobs. In short, this is an opportunity to be the nation we know we can be, the nation where all of us, all of us, not just those at the top are getting to share the benefits of a growing economy in the years ahead. President Biden speaking Thursday at the White House. Meanwhile, Democrats were dealt a setback Sunday when the unelected Senate parliamentarian ruled Democrats could not include a pathway to citizenship to millions of people as part of the reconciliation bill. We go now to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Ro Khanna, Democratic Congress member from California. Welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, Congress member Khanna, you are part of a group of progressive Democrats that say um, that you will vote against the bipartisan bill if it's not voted on alongside this larger, sweeping FDR-esque three and a half trillion dollar plan. Explain your position. Amy, our position has been consistent for months. We want to pass the full agenda that President Biden has set forth. Yes, we need investments in roads and bridges and highways and the traditional infrastructure, but we also need investments in modern infrastructure that takes into account the climate. You can't just have traditional infrastructure without having a clean energy standard, without investing in electric vehicles, without investing in renewable energy. And we need the human investments in child care, in the expansion of Medicare, in free community college. This is what President Biden campaigned on, and we need to deliver. And so how would this work? And talk about the timeline right now and maybe what most people don't realize, this three and a half trillion dollars is not going to be spent this year. Thank you, Amy, for making that clarification. It is over 10 years. People don't talk about the fact that over those same 10 years, we're going to spend seven point five trillion dollars on defense. When they talk about defense, they use the one year number. But when they're talking about social investments, human investments, they use the 10 year number. So this is three hundred and fifty billion dollars uh, over uh, the year. Uh, the other point that is worth making is that the progressives have been willing to have a conversation. Uh, we are willing uh, to engage in a dialogue with 
uh, the White House, with Senator Manchin, with Senator Sinema, of how we get this done. Uh, the question is, are they going to engage in that dialogue? We still haven't heard what Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema are for. They keep saying what they're against. What we want to know is, what are they for? So on Sunday, you tweeted, can anyone explain to me why we're passively giving Elizabeth McDonough, who has not won a single vote more power than any sitting senator or House member, to kill the $15 wage and common-sense immigration policy, overrule her, you said? Well, since most people don't know who she is, explain who she is, what she did, and what you think has to happen. You know, I don't have anything personal against Elizabeth McDonough. I just don't understand this idea that a Senate parliamentarian is going to decide whether this country, whether we can have a $15 minimum wage, whether we can have a path to citizenship for those who are undocumented. I mean, we fight elections over this. This is what congressional elections are over. This is what the presidential election is over. Madison, Jefferson, they didn't put Senate parliamentarian in the Constitution. It's a total artifice. That is a creation of arcane Senate rules. And the point is that the Senate, with a 51 vote majority, uh, is not bound by the Senate parliamentarians' advice of what can pass and what can't pass uh, as an exception to the filibuster. In the past, the Senate mm -hmm. parliamentarian has been overruled uh, many times by presidents and vice presidents. The vice president, of course, is the president of the Senate. And what I've said is that we should overrule uh, her opinion on this. It's just plain wrong. I mean, $15 minimum wage does have a budget impact. Making people citizens who pay taxes does have a budget impact. Uh, and it's mind-boggling to me that this one person is going to decide the fate of millions of people. So what can you do? We, the, the administration can overrule the uh, parliamentarian. I mean, it takes 51 senators to say we disagree with the parliamentarian's ruling. We have those 51 senators with the, our 50 Senate, Senate uh, members plus Vice President Harris. And uh, a number of us said this, that they should have overruled her uh, months ago on the $15 wage. Now this has become a pattern of her obstructing the president's agenda. Uh, she's making opinions. I mean, she's opining that, well, someone may take away immigration status later on. First of all, she doesn't understand constitutional law. You can't just repeal something. It's a violation of the due process. Second, it's not her place to be having those political conversations. No one elected her. Uh, she has no legitimacy. So the president should make it clear, vice president should make it clear that we will overrule her. Now, the question is, well, this will upset norms. This will upset decorum. I mean, what's more important, norms and decorum or the lives of millions of people who don't have citizenship or the lives of millions of people who aren't making a decent wage? So your message to Manchin and Cinema right now, uh, and also the issue of who they're beholden to. For example, the well-known ties of Senator Manchin to the oil, gas and coal industry, uh, and how that can play into um, his opposing a $3.5 trillion deal, which is about the greening of America. You know, uh, Amy, I have a, a, a decent relationship with Senator Manchin. I've never questioned his integrity. My point is, let's get to the right policy. Let's have a conversation. I mean, I understand that there's fossil fuel industry in his state. And so if he has a view that we need to have more investment in his state in clean energy so that these jobs are first in West Virginia, and he can go to his constituents and say, uh, this is not going to cost the economy in West Virginia, it's actually going to add to it. I'm open to having that conversation. Many progressives are open to having a conversation with him. We don't know exactly uh, where he and Senator Sinema are coming from. For example, on voting rights, his plan, it's not one I fully agree with, but it's a good one. And the progressives can rally around his voting rights plan. I guess my question to the senator about Manchin and Sinema is, what is their plan? Where is their, what are they proposing uh, that, as an initial matter, is necessary for us to get to a yes. And we made that clear to both the White House and those senators that they have to come up with a proposal. He, Manchin, has said he has a concern about the money. Um, <clears throat> Manchin has received more campaign donations from the oil, coal and gas industries than any other senator. Maybe that's the money he's concerned about? Well, Amy, look, I, I, I'm having a hearing as a, the environment uh, chair with, where we're going to get the fossil fuel companies in for the first time, Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell. So we're certainly going to realize 
and uh, find out what they've been doing to kill legislation, to have lobbying influence. I will say this. I mean, the West Virginia has a large fossil fuel industry. So if there are individuals who are supporting him in those industries, that to me in and of itself doesn't isn't what is the decisive factor. What is the decisive factor is what is he for? And if he comes onto the table and says, look, I want these things for West Virginia, I think he'll find a lot of people in the caucus are willing to do that. We want to have a dialogue with him. Uh, I personally uh, have never questioned his integrity. What I want to do is how do we get to a yes uh, to, to for the president's agenda? And it's in all of our interests as Democrats to do that. Congressmember Khan, I also want to ask you about these shocking images out of Del Rio, Texas, where Border Patrol agents on horseback have been filmed chasing, grabbing and whipping Haitian asylum seekers. One border agent was heard screaming obscenities at asylum seekers, including children, after they attempted to return to the makeshift camp where uh, close to 15,000 people have been staying under the International Bridge in Del Rio for days. Your response? Well, that's not the American way of doing business. We are a nation that respects the rule of law. We respect human rights. And anyone wearing the United States uniform as a Border Patrol agent needs to live up to those highest standards, no matter how difficult the circumstances. Second, we need an increase in the refugee camp. As your earlier show uh, had indicated, Barbara Lee, myself, other progressives have said that we this year need to increase that to 200,000 refugees, given the crisis in Afghanistan and our obligation there, given the crisis in uh, Haiti. It's uh, 200 million people, 200,000 out of a country of 330 million. We can do that and we can disperse those refugees uh, across the United States after vetting them. Uh, finally, uh, I do think we need in-country processing. I mean, what we, we shouldn't have the, 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 the surge and rush to the border. That's not helpful for anyone. It's not helpful for the protection of human life. We need to be, of course, giving food and water and treating people fairly. But what we really need to say is uh, we need to be processing people uh, before they get to the border and focus on how we deal with the situation in country. The man with the whip on horseback, Border Patrol, said, welcome um, we, um, I want to ask you about the issue of immigration uh, overall. You have the Senate parliamentarian saying there can't be a path to citizenship in um, the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. You have the situation on the border. Uh, President Biden, while introducing uh, ex extremely sweeping, important legislation domestically, uh, when dealing with immigration, um, has very much followed in the footsteps of President Trump sometimes surpassed him when it comes to um, expelling people from the United States. There have been hundreds of Haitians daily now that are being deported back to Haiti, even though the president has ruled that they have TPS for those, you know, who came to the United States before August. What do you think should happen right now? I mean, in Haiti, you have the president assassinated. You have the earthquake that just um, ravaged the country. Well, we, we first have to increase the refugee camp uh, cap to 200,000 so that we can take uh, more Haitian refugees. We need to be figuring out a way to have people processed before there is a uh, rush to the border. If they are flying people back and then processing them there, that is a uh, fine, as long as people are being processed who are genuine uh, asylum refugees and the cap is being raised. And then there are certain common sense things we can do. I mean, my view is we ought to overturn, overrule the parliamentarian and pass a path to citizenship for those undocumented. But even short of that, uh, Zoe Lofgren has a bill that has passed in the House uh, that, would, that was bipartisan, that would allow people as a work permit to come to the United States. It's not a comprehensive solution, uh, but it's a solution that will lead to less debts and less chaos at the border. People can come to the United States, work, and then leave. Uh, and that hasn't gotten a hearing in the Senate. Uh, there are things that we can do at least to make a dent to the problem uh, that we have done in the House and that are uh, sitting uh, without any action in the Senate. 
I want to turn to Afghanistan. On Friday, the Pentagon acknowledged the U.S. drone strike that killed 10 civilians, including seven children. Uh, the last drone strike in the final days of the U.S. withdrawal was a tragic mistake. Uh, the Pentagon previously asserted the strike as righteous, claiming it prevented an imminent threat by ISIS-K fighters. But investigations by The New York Times and other news outlets revealed the victims were instead an aid worker who helped a U.N. aid agency, Zamari Ahmadi, and his family members were the ones killed. Ahmadi's family is demanding a probe into the killing. This is his brother, Ramal. They should accept and pay their damages. They should come to me and apologize and offer their condolences. They should pay blood money. We are innocent. They should evacuate us. This is just an astounding story. He drives into their um, home in Kabul at the end of the day. All of the children, as they did every day, would climb into the car uh, to welcome him home. And that's when the U.S. drone struck and killed them. Lawmakers now in Washington are saying uh, they'd investigate the deadly strike, while activists are renewing calls for an end to U.S. drone warfare. Your response? Oh, it's an unspeakable tragedy. I mean, we, uh, as the United States, uh, struck a family that was completely innocent. Children were killed. Uh, there is no uh, spin or sugarcoating this. This was a brutal, unspeakable tragedy. At the very least, it shouldn't even be a debate. We owe uh, compensation. Uh, we owe the family uh, evacuation. Uh, we owe the family an investigation so that we understand why this happened. But it also raises, Amy, broader questions about uh, oversight and transparency on the drone strike program. Senator Warren and I are working on an issue of what is the standard before a strike is ordered, what is the uh, intelligence that is required, what is the process of who needs to sign off on that. Uh, this is, as you know, not the first time that civilians have been killed with drone strikes, uh, and we need to have uh, far more oversight and far more standards uh, in conducting uh, over-the-horizon operations, which rely on strikes. So, President Biden has pulled the U.S. out of Afghanistan. It's not clear how many mercenaries there, intelligence are still there. Um, the call is for an investigation into the last few weeks of the chaos of the withdrawal. Are you calling for an investigation of the entire 20 years of the U.S. war? We see this drone strike that killed seven children, because so many reporters are there. It's why the Pentagon was forced to admit this, because they interviewed the survivors, they had the video footage. This is a picture of Afghanistan for 20 years in rural areas. You're absolutely right, Amy. I mean, how many drone strikes have killed innocent civilians over the last 20 years. And Anand Gopal's brilliant reporting in The New Yorker, where he talks about how it was actually Ghani's army, General Saadi, who The New York Times had as an op-ed columnist, was ordering the killing uh, of civilians. An op-ed, they allowed an op-ed of his, and he was uh, uh, ordering the killing of civilians in these rural communities. So we need to ask, why is it that for 20 years, general after general came to the United States Congress and said we were winning when we were not? Why is it that we never accepted the Taliban surrender offer back in the early 2000s? Why is it that we were oblivious to the human rights abuses, not just of the Taliban, but of the Afghan army in rural America, in rural Afghanistan? And why is it that uh, we weren't listening to voices like Anand Gopal's, who's been writing about these issues clearly for decades. Where is the myopia in our foreign policy establishment that these perspectives aren't getting uh, through? So would you call for an investigation of the entire Afghanistan war? I have. I, I have called explicitly for an investigation of the 20-year Afghanistan war, including the Afghan papers, where there is evidence that people like Donald Rumsfeld blatantly lied to the American people, knew we were losing, knew that they were out there on TV basically lying. So we need to understand the entire context. And in that 20-year context, of course, uh, investigate the withdrawal. No one is saying it was perfect. I support the president's decision. But let's investigate that as one chapter in a very tragic 20-year story. Very quickly, do you call for an end to the war in Iraq, the U.S. troops to come home? 
I do. And I, I, I think that those troops are uh, sitting targets uh, that are uh, making us uh, a, a less secure. We need to have a responsible way uh, of ending that war. Uh, and you know who I would put in charge, actually, of the 20-year investigation in Afghanistan is, is Barbara Lee. When, it, when I saw uh, on cable news for three weeks, uh, person after person uh, coming on cable television who was an architect of our failed strategy, I said, where is Barbara Lee's voice? I mean, she warned us for 20 years that this is what would in inevitably happen. Let's have her be in charge of an investigation over 20 years of the Afghanistan war. Ro Khanna, we want to thank you for being with us, Democratic Congress member from California. And you can also go to our website to see our interviews with The New Yorker, writer Anand Gopal, and with Barbara Lee, the sole vote against war before the Afghanistan war 20 years ago. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go back in time 10 years to the execution of Troy Anthony Davis. Stay with us. Freedom, here I come Raise your lamp beside the golden door Welcome my hopes and my dreams ashore. Freedom Bound by Emily Michelle. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we look back at a major milestone in the fight to abolish the death penalty in the United States, 10 years ago today, September 21st, 2011, when the state of Georgia executed Troy Anthony Davis for a crime many say he did not commit. He was put to death despite major doubts about evidence used to convict him of killing police officer Mark McPhail, including the recantation of seven of the nine non-police witnesses at his trial. They say they were threatened. As the world watched to see whether Troy Davis's final appeal for a stay of execution would be granted by the U.S. Supreme Court, Democracy Now! was the only news outlet to continuously broadcast live from the prison grounds in Jackson, Georgia. During our six-hour special report, we spoke with Troy's supporters, family members who held an all-day vigil, then heard from those who witnessed his death by lethal injection shortly before midnight. Soon we'll be joined by two of the people who were with us that night. But first, we revisit that day, a decade ago, starting with someone who cannot be with us, Troy's oldest sister, Martina Davis Correa, his most vocal and steadfast advocate, who endured a decade-long battle with breast cancer and died at the age of 44, a few weeks after this. Martina speaking hours before her brother was executed, when she rose to stand from her wheelchair. I want to stand with my family and say that my, our lives and, and my sons and my sisters and brothers' lives, my nieces' lives, has been richer for knowing Troy. Anybody who's met Troy has come away with an imprint of him on their soul. I don't have to tell people what my brother's like, because once they get to meet him, they can see for themselves. And that's why they try to keep him voiceless in the press, because they don't want you to know who Troy Davis is, because then you couldn't stand by and allow the state to kill in your name. So I just would like to say that I am Troy Davis. for 10 years, and I'm, I don't have cancer, but I'm reaping some of the effects of the medicine. Several months ago, I couldn't, I was doing fine. And after that, I couldn't get up out of the chair. But I'm here to tell you that I'm going to stand here for my brother today. Mama. Thank you. Now let's get the work and 
and let's show Georgia that we will do not stand by and we will defy them and we need to start with that gold dome. That was Martina Correa standing up in her wheelchair, the older sister of Troy Davis, his most steadfast advocate, speaking 10 years ago today. She would die a few months later of cancer. As the scheduled time of Troy Davis's execution approached, hundreds of his supporters rallied outside the prison in Jackson, Georgia. Around 7 p.m. Eastern time, the crowd erupted into thunderous cheers. For just a moment, it appeared the Supreme Court had stayed the execution like it had three times before. What did Troy tell you the last time you saw him? The last time he's... It's part of the reasons. We're hearing some kind of cheer yes. that has gone up. Hey. Stay. But the jubilation was short-lived. That was Ben Jealous, who will be joining us in a minute. After realizing the execution had just been delayed, not stayed, supporters of Troy Davis waited for news from the Supreme Court. At about a quarter to 11 p.m., the crowd went silent when it was learned the high court would not stop the execution. Prison officials began the lethal injection process minutes later at about 10.53 p.m. Troy was pronounced dead shortly thereafter at 11.08 p.m. The court-ordered execution of Troy Anthony Davis has been carried out. The time of death is 11.08 p.m. Again, prison official uh, sharing the news that Troy Anthony Davis was executed at 11.08. That was the time of death. I'm standing with... Wesley Board. And I like to say there's been a travesty of justice, and I like to tell America ought to be ashamed of itself, and God help America. And if you're alive with America, please don't come to Georgia. Don't come to Georgia. Don't buy any Georgia pecans. Don't buy any Georgia peaches. Don't buy any trade with Georgia. The whole world. Don't buy anything with Georgia. God bless America, and God bless Troy Davis. Minutes after the state of Georgia executed Troy Davis, a group of reporters who witnessed the execution walked out of the death chamber and onto the prison grounds. They described Troy Davis's final moments. This is John Lewis, a radio journalist at, WAS, at WSB. Basically, it went very quietly. The McPhail family and friends sat in the first row. Warden read the order, asked if Troy Davis had anything to say, and Davis lifted his head up looked at that first row and made a statement in which he said he wanted to talk to the McPhail family and said that despite the situation you're in, he was not the one who did it. He said that he was not personally responsible for what happened that night, that he did not have a gun. He said to the family that he was sorry for their loss, but also said that he did not take their son, father, brother. He said to them to dig deeper into this case, to find out the truth. He asked his family and his family and friends to keep praying, to keep working and keep the faith. And then he said to the prison staff, the ones he said who are going to take my life, he said to them, may God have mercy on your souls. And his last words were to them, may God bless your souls. Then he put his head back down. The procedure began and about 15 minutes later it was over. As Troy Davis's death was announced, I turned to Ben Jealous, who was standing with the family of Troy Davis in the protest. Ben was then the president of the NAACP. You know, my heart goes out and goes out to the McPhail family. We're surrounded by the Davis family. All of our hearts are broken. I've known his nephew since his nephew was three years old. But right now, it goes out to the guards. You know, there was a moment the other day when my staff was in there and the family was in there and the guard leaned over to Martina and asked her to hold it together because he said, we're just barely holding it together. He said, my mom's been, been praying for you guys for days. And there was a sense that if she started crying, the guards would start crying. And we have to remember that you know, these are men, these are working class men and women 
you know, in a rural area looking for a good paying job to support their family. And this shouldn't be part of it. And they know they may have to execute something, but having to execute something that misses so much doubt. When the former warden used to be the boss here saying, stay the execution. The former head of the FBI saying, stay the execution. Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, all saying, stay the execution. It's absolutely inhumane. It's not just a crime against Troy Davis. It's a crime against our democracy. It's a crime against those specific men and women who are called to hold down his left leg or his right leg amid so much doubt when even their old boss is saying, stop this, don't do it. And Ben Jealous will join us in just one moment. Just some of the voices from Democracy Now! special broadcast, September 21st, 2011, 10 years ago today, when Troy Anthony Davis was executed by the state of Georgia. When we come back, we'll speak with two people who were there that night and who continue to fight to abolish the death penalty. In addition to Ben Jealous, Troy's sister, Kimberly Davis, stay with us. Kept a boy who never had a home. Heaven helped a girl who walks the streets alone. And heaven helped the roses if the bombs begin to fall. Lord, won't you help us all? Mm -hmm. Heaven helped the black man if he struggles one more day. Heaven help the white man if he turns his back away. Heaven help the man who kicks the man who has to crawl. Heaven Help Us All by Ray Charles and Gladys Knight. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we mark the 10th anniversary of the execution of Troy Davis, a major milestone in the fight to abolish the death penalty in the United States, we're joined by two people who were there a decade ago, September 21st, 2011, on the grounds of the prison where Troy Davis was executed. They continue to work on the death penalty. In Savannah, Georgia, Kimberly Davis is with us. Troy Davis's sister. She's an anti-death penalty activist. And Ben Jealous is with us, now president of People for the American Way, former president of the NAACP. But first, I want to go to Troy himself. Troy Davis, in his own words. This was May 2009. Amnesty USA activists had a conference call about Troy Davis's case. Troy's sister, Martina Correa, patched Troy in from death row. You know, everything we do today to clear the way for a better tomorrow. Everything is coming to a head, and people are starting to wake up more and more. It's really inspiring kids to get involved, because that's what we really need, because they're going to be our future. And to know that they're concerned about human rights, you know, about activist work and, you know, the justice system, you know, it, it really gives me hope that things are going to change, because this is just the beginning of something that's about to blow up to the point where it, we're going to see some sort of success. We're going to win this fight. We're going to continue to open our eyes. We're going to continue to open these prison doors. We're going to continue to hold accountable all those that are in charge of this, these unjust systems. And together, we can realize that if we let our voice and activists work be seen and be heard, that there's nothing that we can't change the positive aspect of this world. You know, we can correct all the wrongs if we just continue to stand together. And that's what's most important. We need to continue to stand together and educate each other and don't give up the fight. That was two years uh, before Troy was executed, 10 years ago. We're joined now by Troy Davis's sister, Kim Davis, and Ben Jealous, president of People for the American Way. In March, Virginia became the first Southern state to abolish the death penalty, and President Biden's Justice Department has ordered a moratorium on carrying out federal death sentences after a surge in executions under President Trump in his final days. But more than 2,500 people remain on state, federal, and military military death rows across the United States. Kimberly Davis, um, I know this is a hard time. It is 10 years later, but it brings you right back to that moment that your brother was killed by the state of Georgia, even as so many, including the Pope, begged for a reprieve, including the Republican Congress member in the area, including former um, death row prison commissioners. Um, Kimberly, your thoughts today? 
Well, my thoughts today, um, you know, just looking back over the 10 years, um, we've come a long way. Um, you know, we, like Troy said, this didn't start with him. It started before him, and it was going to come after him. And he wanted us to continue to fight. He said, you know, with the injustice, he said that we needed to stand up and make sure we had, make sure we, our voices are heard. We need to stand up against injustice. You know, it's just been so much in the media. Well, we can see on the news everything that's going around in the world. But, you know, one thing we know, we can stand on faith, and we will demolish the death penalty one state at a time. Um, we were just, you know, just thinking back over the past, uh, the past years on how we have been able to, you know, j just get out and mobilize. Um, you know, one thing, it is one thing to mobilize, but then it's another thing to organize. And with my brother's case, you know, we had so many people in so many different countries, so many different races, you know, come together for one cause. And that cause was, you know, to prove my brother was innocent. We had so many people, you know, I mean, thousands and thousands of petitions that were actually signed people that believed in my brother's innocence. And like he said, he took his innocence to his grave. And, you know, it makes me feel good. My my baby sister, uh, she made a comment. She said that the world today, they're still talking about Troy Anthony Davis. So we know that Troy Davis did make a mark on the world. And we're just continuing to continue to make that mark. And we want that mark to stand. We want that mark to stick. We want to continue to fight until we demolish the death penalty one state at a time. And Ben Jealous, your thoughts today as we talked to you 10 years ago on the grounds of the death row prison. Um, the point person on the Supreme Court that night deciding whether Troy Davis would live or die was Clarence Thomas, um, who hails from Pinpoint, Georgia, a community founded by uh, freed slaves. Um, there was a moment where it was believed that, once again, after three other death warrants were vacated, the fourth one would be two, but that wasn't the case. As you reflect back now, your thoughts and where the movement is today. Well, thank you, Amy. And, and my uh, connection here is breaking up, so I apologize for stepping on you. But the, you know, I was, I was tearing up earlier. Um, it was painful to be kind of brought back to that moment Troy was innocent. He is innocent. Um, and the deep irony uh, is that the state, Georgia, has no interest in finding the killer for Officer McPhail. And that is perhaps the greatest tragedy here. They killed an innocent man, and they really don't care to find the killer of the police officer who was killed that night. The, um, the movement has to keep pushing forward with abolishing the death penalty. Virginia was a huge victory. It would not have been possible. But for this campaign, just like abolishing it in Connecticut the year after and Maryland the year after that, the first state south of the Mason-Dixon to abolish the death penalty would not have been possible. And really not, without, not possible without Troy's leadership. I remember sitting with Troy on death row and explaining to him everything we were doing to uh, make sure we had the votes on the Board of Pardon and Paroles. And we did have the votes until the, the, the chairman, who was black, switched his vote having voted for a state before, to make sure that the governor got his execution. And Troy looked at me and he said, Ben, he said, that's good. He said, this is Georgia. If Georgia wants to kill me, they will. We have to also make sure that the world remembers my name, that they understand what's happening here. And that's where the hashtag too much doubt came from. And about a month after Troy was executed, Public support for the death penalty had fallen to an all-time low since uh, it had been momentarily abolished from 1972 to 1976. And the Gallup organization does the polling, uh, credited that hashtag campaign. And it was a reminder, honestly, of what millions of young people on a new platform back then called Twitter uh, were able to get done, shift public opinion. It's kind of hashtag activism that us older activists can deride absolutely played a role in, in creating the opportunity where we've been able to abolish the death penalty in multiple states. We have a few more to go, 
When we finally abolish it in 26 states, we will have a, a majority of states opposed and be able to go into the Supreme Court, as we have on the juvenile death penalty since I first met Troy, as we have uh, on uh, the death penalty for people with low IQs, and get the Supreme Court to abolish it in its entirely, having met the standard for both cruel and unusual punishment. And that's that's where the, the movement has to go now. Let I me mean, explain that. Uh, so that's extremely significant, uh, how you could prove cruel and unusual and how you can do this at the Supreme Court, given who is on it. Yeah, well, you know, the last part's a bit harder. Um, Donald Trump has packed the Supreme Court. With that said, Supreme Courts have been packed before and have often surprised the conservative movement when people just hold to kind of basic constitutional principles. And one of those is the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Now, now that's a high bar. Uh, the standard it's based on for British common law is cruel or unusual punishment, meaning if it's either, it would be unconstitutional. But in America, it's and, so it must be both. The Supreme Court has long held that the death penalty is cruel just by its nature. Uh, you know, executing a human being is cruel. Um, unusual, the standard is a majority of states opposed. That means you have to get to 26 states. This is the strategy that we use to abolish the juvenile death penalty. You know, as of like maybe 1999 or 2000, our nation was only one of 10 on planet Earth that was still sentencing children to death. But a couple of years later, we were able to abolish it in the Supreme Court because, as a movement, we got more than 26 states, uh, more than 25, at least 26 states, to abolish the juvenile death penalty. And then the Supreme Court said, yes, we've long held that the death penalty was cruel for juveniles. We will uh, abolish it. We did the same thing with people for people with, with low IQs. Actually, a few years before that, the people that the court refers to as the mentally retarded, a terrible term, but that's the court's term. Um, and similarly, this, the court has held that the death penalty itself is cruel for anyone. We just, once again, just got to get to a majority of states, and we are on our way. Virginia, state with a terrible history when it comes to the death penalty. Uh, multiple innocent people executed in that state, a state that even made it possible at one point in its history to literally lynch somebody in the courtroom, to charge, arrest, convict, sentence, and execute somebody all in one day. And when you see a state like that abolish the death penalty, you know that the days are numbered in our nation for the death penalty as a whole. We are very, very close. Why wasn't Troy Davis's execution investigated, the continuation of the investigation into his case, where many pointed to another man who is the one who walked into a police station that night with a lawyer and pointed the finger at Troy Davis, who many say did not have a gun that night that the off-duty police officer was killed? Yeah, you know, that's the thing. I mean, that man, Red, he appears to be a police informant. His, uh, he's been in every time. It's like catch and release. Every time he's been in jail, they let him go. He's, he has a rap sheet, you know, longer than the office I'm sitting in right now, in fine print. Um, and it appears that he's the killer in this case. Absolutely. Um, and it is mind blowing. It is absolutely mind-blowing to look at the two men. You have to remember that Troy was put on death row by nine eyewitnesses. Seven of them recanted. The only two that wouldn't were, were uh, him, Red, I forget his last name, and uh, a woman who claimed that she recognized Troy from, from over 100 yards away on a moonless night when he was standing under a tree within a group of men. This is a dark-skinned black man across a very dark, long distance in the shadows. And she said without a benefit of the doubt, she was completely not credible. Meanwhile, six more eyewitnesses came forward to say that it was not Troy, it was Red. And so you now have 13 people, including seven who were among the nine that put him on death row, saying that Troy is not the one, those seven saying that they had lied. That's why there was too much doubt. It is clear that the, that the killer's out there, and it is unclear why the police apparently uh, have protected that man for decades. I think his name was Red Coles. Um, Kimberly Davis, Georgia still has the death penalty. What message do you have for those on death row and for the people of Georgia, as, uh, well, Virginia's just become the first state in the South to, um, to get rid of the death penalty, to abolish it? Well, we just want the people in Georgia to know that we are still on the battlefield fighting for them, um, and we will continue to fight for them to get this death penalty abolished. 
Um, we have, uh, you know, a lot of, um, it's a couple of guys that's on death row that actually still reach out to the family. And, you know, they just ask us for prayer because sometimes they say that, you know, that's something that they don't get. They just ask us, you know, for prayer and for us to continue to stand for them and for us to be the voice of the voiceless. And that's what Martina always said. She was the voice of the voiceless. And that's what we're going to continue to do, to be the voice of the voiceless and stand with them. I want to thank you so much for being with us. We've been speaking with Kimberly Davis, Troy Davis's sister, and Ben Jealous, now president of People for the American Way, former head of the NAACP. Tonight, I'll be moderating a live-streamed event at 8 p.m. Eastern Time uh, to honor Troy Davis's life and reflect on the movement he helped build with Troy Davis's sister, Kimberly Davis, and his nephew, Dijon Davis Correa. Details at democracynow.org. Democracy now is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Gesder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maru Tarasena, Tammy Warnoff, Chirina Nadora, Sam Alkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Adriana Contreras. Special thanks to John Randolph, Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.